first lesson this morning is a responsive reading for the 111th Psalm. Praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright and in the congregation. The works of the Lord are great, studied by all the pleasures in them. His work is honorable and glorious, and His righteousness endures forever. He has made His wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. The works of His hands are verity and justice. All His precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever, and are done in truth and uprightness. He has sent redemption to His people. He has commanded His covenant forever. Holy and awesome is His name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding of all those who do His commands. His praise endures forever. Our second lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians. Beloved, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Each one should test his own actions, then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to somebody else. For each one should carry his own load. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially those who belong to the family of believers. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God. First, I must ask everybody this morning this question. How many of you have ever been forgiven for a grievous sin? Don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. How many of you have been forgiven for something which was a grievous sin? I don't mean run the mill. I mean how do you suppose Peter felt when it became clear that Jesus had been raised from the dead? You think he might have felt a little guilty? Do you agree that it might have been difficult for Peter to make eye contact with Jesus? Why is it in the accounts of Christ's post-resurrection appearances to the disciples as a group that the rash, bold, outspoken, impulsive Simon Peter from the earlier chapters seems now to blend into the middle, melting perhaps to a remote corner of the room? Or was he even present on those occasions? Perhaps he felt unworthy. To see the risen. The scriptures do not provide us with explicit answers to these questions, but it is interesting, isn't it? That the last chapter of the Gospel of John, which most scholars believe has been tacked on to that Gospel by John, is an account that is particular to Peter mm -hmm. and to Peter's restoration. And that's what we're talking about today. Thank you, Lord, for your word and for this account of the disciple with which we're most familiar. And for the evidence that this passage provides us of your forgiveness and your determination not to lose one who's been given you. And your plan for each one of us, no matter how broken our lives might be. Guide us, Lord, we pray. Anoint the lips of your servant and the ears and the hearts of all of us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me give you a little uh, Simon Peter flashback. 
as I said, uh, we, more is written about Peter than all the other disciples combined. In the and as is the case, most often, the more we find out about someone, the more intimately we become acquainted, the more flaws we find. The more we realize that, gee, our notion of this person as a flawless hero were misguided. He was a hero, but he was flawed. One of the reasons I love to read biographies is uh, especially lots of biographies, not, not one writer's spin on this character of mystery or that character, but many authors to find out all sorts of perspective on this life. That's the way to get a balanced picture. Uh, I, I attest to the testimony of all married couples in verifying this. Uh, you married someone who you dated. And when you dated that person, uh, unless you dated a very long time, you developed a rather succinct and positive picture of this person. And I've said this many times, dating is probably the least honest social enterprise in existence. We date one of our best behavior. I've shared this many times too. When I was dating Sandra, we could speak on the phone for hours. <laughs> I mean that. It now seems hard to believe. Because now people, when I talk on the phone, even to Sandra, it's like, yes? How can I help you? That's it? Okay, thanks. See you, honey. Bye. <laughs> Long conversations are part of the dating life, rarely part of the married life. And when Sandra married me, she found out to her horror that I was not perfect. <laughs> and as our marriage progressed, she found out to her increasing horror that I was far from perfect. And then she found out that I was completely flawed. And a person not worthy to trust. That sounds far so. Nobody, well, Cursed is the man who puts his flesh in man. We are not able to consistently and faithfully hold your trust. I don't mean I mean mankind when I say that. None of us is. I counsel young married couples all the time. Premarital counseling is the caution that if you think all of your happiness hinges on this person, stop thinking. Your, your happiness hinges on the grace of God. And any, any part that your spouse can play in that is, is mercy and grace and bounding. And so Peter, we, we know, most of us know Peter because of his flaws. His, his awkwardness, his, his misspeaks, his, uh, his uh, failure. So let's do a quick review. By the way, I must say this. All of us would rather write our own biography. There's a lot of word right now in the street about uh, Miss, Mrs. Clinton's upcoming autobiography. And now people are saying, well, of course, this is going to pave the way for one of the presidents. Whether it does or not, she is doing what everybody does. They want to write their own story. They don't want anybody else to tell it. I know everything that you need to know and nothing that you, everything that you don't need to know. So we're all like that. Uh, the most honest appraisal of your character will come from somebody else. That's all there is to it. And the most honest appraisal of your character, if you are a married person, will come from your spouse. Not your boss, not your, not your fellow man, not your golf buddies, not your fellow workers. It will come from your spouse who sees you in the dark, in the light, dressed and undressed, at your best, at your worst. They'll give the truest account of who you are. And so, now to Peter. About Peter, first of all, he's a blue-collar working man. <coughs> that you can, we can, some of us can only get down with. Uh, Peter was a fisherman, and he appeared to be the only disciple who was married. We aren't certain, but the scriptures indicate that Peter was married, is silent about the others, so we'll see. Uh, when called by Jesus... Peter, along with his partners in business, James and John, followed without hesitation. Positive character trait. Peter, though, was impulsive. Often acting or speaking without thinking, 
but also more ready to step out in faith and unafraid to speak his mind. Good and bad. Salt and pepper. Like with you and me. Peter was given keen spiritual insight and Jesus made it clear that God had important plans for Peter. Yet, it was Peter who fails Jesus most spectacularly. At the time of his greatest need, Jesus had already predicted this, but Peter refused to, to accept Jesus' prophetic word. Remember that? Jesus said, uh, well, Peter said, I will never, boy, I'll be the last guy in this room to fail you. When Jesus said, you know, when this all comes down, you're all going to hit the road. You're going to run away from me. As fast as you can. And Peter said, oh, not me. All these others might, but I'll die for you. Remember those words? They came back to haunt Peter. <laughs> At the Last Supper, when Jesus predicted that his disciples would ultimately desert him in the hour of betrayal, Peter made a boastful promise to the Lord, I will never fail you. And I think he meant it when he said it. I don't think he was going hard. I think Peter, in his heart, really thought, you know what? I'm down with this completely. I'm all in. I don't care what happens. I will stick it out. I will not... Fail. I think you will admit that. Like we do. We make promises. Peter exhibited awkward courage at the moment of Christ's arrest in the garden against the this story. When Peter strapped on a sword, I've always said this in the pulpit, I'm you tired of hearing me saying, but I, the picture of a fisherman with a big old sword tickles me. My guess is Peter was as skillful with a sword as I would be. And my guess is when Peter pulled out that big old sword, to protect Jesus, he was not aiming at that guy's ear. <laughs> he was trying to split his head open, I'm sure. Or cut his head off or something. All he got was the ear. I can see it now. And Jesus is saying, you know, trying not to laugh, Jesus said, stop it. Put your sword away. What's wrong with you? You're a fisherman. This all has to happen. So in spite of that moment of courage, when, G when Peter was really keeping his promise that, you know, I'm ready to die for you. I'll certainly fight for you. <laughs> Just a few hours later, when Peter was questioned about his being a disciple, he denied Jesus three times. So Peter had, his failure, his failure had been prophesied by Jesus, but Jesus also predicted great things for Peter afterward. And this is what I want to focus on this morning. The fact that God will humble you when you need to be humble. But that doesn't make you less worthy of service. It doesn't make God love you less. It's like when you correct your children. You know, I can memories of correcting my children. I can memories when I was so mad I had to cool off for half an hour before I meted out the punishment. I had to just chill because I was so dead gum mad. But you know what? I never once said, you know what? I'm not a kid. I never once said that. And it's encouraging for me to know that even though I needed to be and continue to need to be humbled by the Lord, it isn't because He's pushed me out of the way. It isn't because He's done with me. It's because He has something else for me to do now that requires a new humility. So here's Peter. I'm not suggesting for a minute now that, that God caused Peter to deny Jesus. That was Peter's choice. But now I get the sense that when, when Peter went to the tomb and saw the bandages and the body wrappings on the shelf in that tomb and walked away, the Bible says, wondering what had happened, I see a man with such mixed emotions. Surely he was thrilled at the prospect of Jesus' resurrection, but just as surely his exaltation was sorely tempered by the guilt he felt over his denial of Jesus. He denied even so much as even having known Jesus. So now I'm wondering if Peter's saying, gee, if he is a man, if he is risen, that's great, but man, what does that mean? I mean, I'm the one who absolutely failed. So let's turn to our text. John 21. As I said before, uh, almost all Bible scholars, conservative and otherwise, agree that it appears that the Gospel of John ended 
with the last verse of chapter 20. Let's read that. Uh, at chapter 20, in my uh, New King James, uh, the titles are The Empty Tomb, Mary Magdalene Sees the Risen Lord, The Apostles Commissioned, and then the story about Thomas. And then verse 30 of chapter 20 reads this. And truly, the author concludes, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Is there ever a better place for the end than that? And almost all scholars believe that chapter 21 was added later. But almost all scholars believe that it was added by John. That John, thinking about this, you know what? There's another story I'm going to tell. It's about my, my friend Peter. And it begins one of those days when we're fishing. So let's turn to John 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, which is, of course, the Sea of Galilee. And in this way, he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, what did he say? Let's go fishing. Now, I wonder about that. This is some time after Jesus was seen. This is, by John's account, this is the third revelation of the risen Christ to his disciples. And uh, he told them to wait. He's in one chapter, in one scripture, in one, in one gospel, he tells them to go to Galilee. So they are there, and they're waiting. And Peter, who was a fisherman by trade, said, well, we might as well go fishing. Is this to get his problems off his mind? Is this just to pass the time? Maybe he needed money. We don't know. Let's go. I'm going fishing, Peter said. They said to him, we're going to go with you. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Of course, they fished at night because the greatest chance of a great catch was at night by dark. When the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, what an interesting phrase, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast it out on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. It's broad daylight now. You know, these are professionals. These are professionals. Here is some nameless amateur giving advice. I kind of bristle when, when people who I think don't know give me advice on what I'm pretty sure I do. When I was in the HVAC trade doing, doing service work or installation work in someone's house, my winning joke was, well, this will cost you $2,000, $3,000 if you hang around. <laughs> Uh, so Jesus, who they do not recognize, says, Can't even cast it on the wrong side of the boat, you guys, on the other side. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of all the little fish. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. It's got to be Jesus. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment, you know, they, they, they fished pretty much naked. They, they fish in their loincloths. It was wet business, right? And they took off their, their robes. So Peter now puts on his, his outer garment and plunged into the sea. Peter, if that were true, he couldn't wait to row to shore. Whether he swim or waited, we do not know. But Peter got out of the boat, not the first time in the Gospels. He got out of the boat and couldn't wait. Now, I wondered if he just couldn't wait to apologize. I got it. I got to get there first. I want to say this. I want to have some quiet time with Jesus. I don't, we aren't told that. We all we know is that Peter could not wait. He put on his clothes, then took him to the water. Seems kind of like Peter, right? He get dressed and get in the water. Right? Let's go figure. It's Peter. But his other disciples came in a little, the little boat, for they were not far from shore, about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there. A fish and fish laid on it and bread. Where did Jesus get his fish? That's always my question. Where, is he been fishing? Are these miracle fish? Or did Jesus know his fishing business? We are told. But he had fish going and cooking. Jesus said to them, bring some of your fish. Add to my catch. We'll have a feast. Some Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. 
an exact count. Interesting, isn't it? And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Isn't that curious? They knew it was Jesus, but they would not. We're busting to say, Are you with Jesus? Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So, John sets the stage for probably the second most famous dialogue, maybe the third most famous dialogue in all the Bible, behind Jesus and Nicodemus, behind Noah and the Lord, and now Peter and Jesus after Christ's resurrection. John 21, 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, a very formal address. Simon, son of Jonah, Simon bar Jonah, do you love me more than these, more than what we are told? More than these fish? More than these other disciples? More than your livelihood? More than what you're familiar with? Do you love me more than these? We are not told. Do you love me more than these? Peter said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my sheep. And Jesus goes on, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when Jesus had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. Now what would have been This is the most curious and awkward account. Three times Jesus asked Peter the same question. Three times Peter provides the last an the, the answer, the last time with emphasis. And three times Jesus responds to Peter's response with a command. Feed my sheep. Tend my lambs, feed my lambs. And, and, so, and so forth it goes. Now, you've all probably all heard this. In fact, maybe this is a chance for a little review. Yeah, yeah my ex cathedral See here? From Jim? Uh, you've heard this a million times. Uh, the four Greek words for love. What are they? Agape would be number four on the list. You've heard this from me many times, too. You know, the, 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 the love that is selfless, the love that requires no recompense, the love that is not, does not require reciprocation. And it is the love that God has for his people. And Christ has for his church. It's the purest love. It's the kind of love that loves because it said it would, not because it's good love. Not because the, 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 the uh, recipient of that love deserves it. It's because I promise that love. Alright? Phileo, yeah. The, uh, City of brotherly love, right? The affectionate love for a pal, for a friend. I mean, uh, some of you people, I, I like to think, you're married folk, uh, your spouse is not only your spouse, but your, your best friend. You have love that goes beyond the God, that goes beyond the third type, eros, which is the erotic romantic love. Those are great too, but also your, your spouse is your pal, the person that you most, you, you most like to spend time with, the person you most like to be around. For those of us who have lost spouses, this is as much, this is the worst loss, is the fact that I walked with her. Uh, you know, the, the loss of romance without his presence or her presence makes, makes some kind of awful, awful sense. And 
I can still say I love him or his memory without reservation, but I miss the friendship. And then there's Storge. This is one that says those are those us. That is the, uh, the affection that you have. I call it general affection. Here's what I always say this. I love these books. They're getting worn out. I hate to face the prophet getting new ones because I love these. So I love this. It's my favorite chair. That's usually called my warrior and my chair. <laughs> <laughs> this is my favorite chair. That's my chair. I love this chair. All right, so. And, and Peter and Jesus use two forms of this word in this dialogue, if you read the original Greek. Uh, twice, Jesus asked Peter, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me with the highest kind of love? Do you love me, but? And Peter answers both those times with phileo. Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Like a pal. The third time Jesus asked in the original Greek, he says, Peter, do you feel it? Do you really love me like that? Peter says, you know I do! What? Now, I've wrestled with this for years. And I think the most trustworthy scholars say, don't wrestle with it. Because in John's Gospel, those two terms are used interchangeably. The, the breakdown that we've set up for the four loves, C.S. Lewis's famous essay, is really not pure. It doesn't always apply in every passage, Old or New Testament. John uses those two terms interchangeably. So I don't know how much to make it out. Maybe we can. We should. We can try, if Jesus is saying so. Maybe if we want to be pure and say Jesus and, and, and say that Jesus asked Peter twice. Do you love me with a completely selfless, sacrificial love, Peter? And Peter could not say yes to that, but he could say, but I do love you. No, I, I can't love you like that. And here's my thing with Peter. I've already proven that. I, I caved. I know that word. So I, I don't dare suggest that I can love you like that, even though I want to, but I still love you. I still love you, Jesus. I love you as much as I'm able. And Jesus, in my scenario, says, well, okay then, you love me that much. Oh, you know I do. Absolutely. And without saying another word, Peter is restored. He is reconciled to Jesus. All that business in the courtyard of the high priest is forgotten. Never once do we hear Peter say, please forgive me, Lord. Never once do we hear Jesus say to Peter, Oh, listen, bud, I know you, you really messed up back there, but you know what? I still love you and I forgive you. We don't ever see, hear those words. But we can see in this exchange, after the third time, when Jesus says, Feed my sheep, in verse 18, most assuredly, and he goes on to describe Peter's future. And he has great plans for Peter. And he begins to spell them out. And one of the plans is going to wind up with Peter's death. Jesus is describing in so many words that you will die serving me. Now so many people have added uh, so many traditions to the notion of your hands will be stretched out. You know, you've heard the notion of uh, an apocryphal book called the Acts of Peter. That's where it first appeared that maybe Peter was crucified upside down by his own request. And who knows? That might have happened. We are going to be sure, but Jesus is saying, I have, my plans for you haven't changed, pal. But in order for my plans for you, the ones I've always had for you to play out to my glory, you had to be humbled. You had to be humbled. And this vehicle of your denial and your chagrin over your denial is what I needed to tell you these words. I love you. And I got plans for you. Now that is got to be, they, they have to be, the kindest words that a broken person can be. Oh yeah, I'm not, I'm not pretending you didn't do this awful thing, the wife says to her unfaithful husband. I'm not pretending that you didn't do all these things, the person who has been stolen from tells the person who robbed him. I'm not pretending that this never happened. 
the broken hearted person says to the person who beat her down with words, hateful, awful words. I'm not saying those things didn't happen. I'm saying that I refuse to let that event my love for you. I refuse. My love for you is my love for you because I promised it would be my love for you. Jesus never stopped loving Peter. <coughs> Peter stopped feeling love because he was broken by his own failure. Now, I'm not sure how many marriages that break up over infidelity break up because the, the injured spouse can't forgive or the spouse who injured the injured spouse can't be forgiven. I'm not sure. But Peter needed to be broken. He needed to be humbled just like you do, just like I do. Not once in a lifetime, but again and again and again. And here's why. Listen. <coughs> Pride is a grace block. <laughs> I don't know who said that first. It wasn't me, but I like that phrase. Pride is a grace locker. And then Peter all folded himself, saying, Jesus, all these other 11 guys, they might fly. I'll be there at the end. He said that, A, because he believed it, and B, because he, had, he was prideful. It never occurred to Peter he might fail. He had a record. So he needed to be taught an important lesson that pride is a grace blocker. I can't get through to you when you're like this. You're not going to feel my grace. You're not going to feel you need my grace when you're so on top of things that it's all under your control. Ever get like that? Sometimes you do. It might only last for a day or two, but there are times like that when you are so certain that you're in the right path, that everything is Jake, that you have stopped even thinking about God's grace and mercy. So pride is a grace blocker, and this important second important lesson is just because you are broken does not mean you are useless. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yeah. And that may be one of the great mysteries in all scripture. That God continues to minister to the world with his imperfect church full of broken, flawed people, clay vessels just full of leaks. He continues to do his work because he loves us. And we need occasionally to be reminded of that. And thank the Lord, every year we come around to the Easter season, we revisit the story and remember again, yes, God loves us. Well, we we got to turn, we do this every, every Easter. We've got to turn to Romans 7 and read Paul's, uh, Paul's own personal amen to this lesson. I read this, it seems like every three or four months, because it's my story, again and again. The Apostle Paul, who we believe to be, if they were a ranking of Christians, he'd be number one. Paul writing in Romans chapter 7. He's been talking about um, his credentials as a Pharisee, a person who revered the law, who obeyed the law much better than most, who saw the law for what he thought it was, and took it very seriously, and how he has come to see how the law failed him. Not because the law was flawed, but because his understanding was. So Paul writes in Romans 7, 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I don't understand. For what I want to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that's what I do. If then I do what I, want, I, I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. I know what's right. 
Why can't I consistently do what's right? I know what's wrong. Why do I? Why am I always drawn to it? Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? That is the essential predicament of every person who follows Christ. And if you don't think it's true of you, you got a pride issue. And Paul, almost feeling the emotions of Peter, is saying, I am wretched. You'd think by now I'd be able to do what I want to do and not do what I don't want to do. You'd think, but I can't. And I know it's wrong because I know the law. I know the law that defines God's holiness condemns me. The law condemns me to death. And my life is a proof text for that. What will become of me? This is almost over Martin Luther Crazy. And then Paul remembers in verse 25, I thank God who will deliver me from this body of death. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's it. Faith is the victory that overcomes the world. It overcomes my habitual, disgusting, underproductive, So no one is beyond reconciliation. No one is beyond restoration except the person who doesn't feel he or she needs restoration. Except for the person who feels he or she doesn't need to be reconciled. Oh, I'm gentle with God. I'm cool with God. made one more note. And this was me responding to my first study of this text. Me? Proud? I'm no stuck-up, smart-alecky Pharisee. I'm a regular guy. I'm a sinner, but I work hard. I do my best. I take care of my family. What do you think about that? When you have got a sense of pride that blocks God's grace, you'll find yourself a proponent of what one scholar called rational disobedience. When it comes to issues about your personal conduct, about your personal choices, about about money. You behave, you disobey on the basis of rational, of rationale. I, you know what? I know what the Bible says about money. But my situation is this, so I'm going to obey that law like this. I know what the Bible says about this kind of conduct, but in this day and age, things being as they are, I'm going to obey that law this way. And it goes on and on and on. And listen, I hate to say this because I say it so often. This is what is being preached in many mainline churches. What I call rational disobedience. Does not, does, not, does not deny that God has plans for us and has rules and laws, but they must be obeyed within a context that makes sense. And some of the things they preach would make yours fall. The shock. And so, maybe those three lessons. That pride is a grace blocker, that an indicator of personal pride is your rational disobedience to this or that command of the Lord in Scripture. And that you may be broken, but you are never useless in sight. And that, listen, God has blessed you.
I don't care how old you are. I don't care what's your personal situation, good or bad, fat or thin monetarily, stable or unstable health-wise, or in your marriage, God has plans for you. Otherwise, he'd take you. Don't forget that. In your brokenness, in my situation, God has plans for you right there in that spot. But well, you mean when things get... When things come together for me, I mean, then, then, yeah, no, no, now, right now. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow, even now, God has a plan. And it is a plan that we should be wanting to know more about and pursue. God is not going to ask you to do something when you're not healthy, that only a healthy person can do, but he has a special ministry for you in your spot right now. Whether you're 25 or 45, a parent or a grandparent, whether you are getting way up there in years like me, God has a plan. Don't let your pride block His grace so that you can exercise His will in that plan. To His glory and to your blessing. I've said it so many times. If we, uh, if we believe God, there's not a single moment of our life that will be wasted. We'll have, we, we can't have a productive life right up to the very end. That's a pretty cool promise. So, Lord, we visit Peter again and review his ups and downs again. We hear stories about Peter we've already heard. We, we try to learn lessons from not only his life, but his, his final confrontation with the risen Lord. And Lord, it is my prayer for each one in this church who feels useless for any reason, whether it's brokenness or pride. Lord, I pray that you open that, that person's eyes this, this day and make them understand, Lord, that the only thing that stands in the way of a close, intimate relationship with you is unconfessed sin. And the only thing that blocks their ability to flourish in their faith is their pride. Not anything you're holding back. So, Lord, show us where we need to change. Show us, Father, the areas in our lives where we need to lay down and die. So that the risen Christ might live in our place. We do seek, Father, as individual Christians and as a little church in this little town, to be all you have called us to be. And to do all you have called us to do. Make us ready, Father, as Eric prayed. Lord, show us how to believe that which you tell us. May you be glorified, Father, in the life that follows. May we all live, like, uh, Father, in the full light of the resurrection of our Lord. We pray in His name. Amen.